Hello! In this video I want to talk about the T-diagram or the tombstone diagram which is this thing that you see down here which basically just represents a compiler that uh, takes C++ code, puts out C code and is written in machine code. I will also um, explain how to actually read this thing and give some more examples later on. But let's first start off with this and let's forget about the T, just let's think of uh, a usual compiler. Let's imagine the compiler as some kind of machine or filter that you like um, put something in and then it does something with it and it puts something out. So for example you're putting out you're putting in C++ code and the compiler does something with it and it knows for example that C out relates to 1110100 I don't know. So the compiler itself has a logic that knows how to translate this to this. And this logic is also written in some code, right? So um, it might be that the compiler is written in machine code itself. So some crazy programmer typed in all zeros and ones to get a compiler that creates machine code out of C++ code. It might also be the case that the compiler itself might be written in Python. And this is a very important construct in this explanation. Of course, the compiler, when you think of it as a program, must be executed on the CPU. So it must be somehow um, be machine code, right? But put this image a little bit away. Just think of it like a compiler can be a Python script, can be a Ruby script, can be Objective-C code, right? So the, the language, that we used to write the compiler. This is what is important here. To make things a little bit more clear, hopefully, let's take this picture again and say we have C++ code that we put in and we have Python, a Python script that actually translates our C++ code and what we get out is, let's make this example with the C code. So we get, we as an input, we get C++ code and put out C code and our compile script is written in Python and it might be the case that we got some kind of interpreter inter interpreter I'm not sure about the pronunciation here at the background sorry in the background and I hope you understand this picture here but I don't want to confuse us so I remove that one and now we leave the presentation mode make this image a little bit smaller and rotate it And we scale it up again. And what do we have now? Now we have a T diagram. And to make this a little bit, just a little bit more pretty, because I'm writing with my mouse, we have a compiler or a compiled script, because it's written as a Python script, that takes C code and converts it to C code. I hope this makes things clear about how to read this thing. So this diagram is not about um, how do we, so this this one T is not about how do we execute this PY. It's just that this compiler itself is written in Python. You might also imagine like a kind of an arrow here that shows that C++ code is translated to C code in Python. Let's get to a next example and we make this a little bit more general. We have a language A which is converted to or compiled to a language B and we use a Python script again. To run the Python script itself, of course, in the end we need some kind of machine code. So to run the Python script itself, we have a Python inter interpreter. I checked the pronunciation, hope it's right that will take our Python code and run it on the CPU for us. Just ignore what you just saw. I'm going to write it down now. This way is some kind of simple representation of an actually different fact. So to write this thing here correctly, we should write it like this. Then remove move these borders and here we go. So what we have is basically our interpreter is basically just a machine 
that takes Python code as input and puts out machine code that can be run on the CPO. But what I didn't explain just 20 seconds ago was what language did we actually use to write the in interpreter itself. So the interpreter might be written in C, might also be written in Python itself, or I don't know, might be written in machine code, right? So let's just assume it is written in C++. And before we go on, um, I hope you understand that these two things here are connected. And it's very easy to see because they are written next to each other. But as always, smart guys always think of ways to make studying for new students very hard. So they tend to use a representation that is a little bit disturbing at the beginning maybe. That's the reason why we will delete this and write it down here like this. So this might be an image you saw before if you checked out other videos. Important part here, remember that these two go together, not these two. If you want these two to go together, then you have to write it like this, okay? But we're talking about these two going together. So, okay, we get this compiler that translate our, translates our A language to a B language. And we got this nice interpreter in Python that creates a machine code. And it is written in C++. But C++ cannot be run on the CPU. So what we need is something that translates C++ to something different. So something that takes C++. And because we want to run C++, we need to create machine code. So we need this new compiler. and. Maybe it's very easy because C++ and C is very similar um, to write this compiler in C. But still we got the same problem. We cannot execute this C program because it's just C, right? It's not machine code. So once again, we need something that takes, in this, uh, in this case, C code and creates machine code. And this time we're choosing assembler to do exactly that. So that is our almost last compiler. But still, assembler can still not be run on the CPU. So we need something that can run, that translates assembler to machine code. And because assembler and machine code is pretty, not, not so much different. So the, it, the translation is very easy. Um, that's the reason why it's pretty easy to write a compiler in machine code itself. And this is the reason why our last compiler is written in machine code and creates machine code out of assembler code or assembly, sorry, assembly code. I'm wrong. Sorry for that. Okay. So what do we see here? We see a very nice compiler chain that is actually, I think pretty much of the truth or could be probably is not because it's very long and slow, but this is like a, a generation, right? So, um, at first we wrote machine code to write programs, right? But people thought it's easier to write assembly programs than writing machine code. So they invented this nice compiler here. Um, let's say this is our first compiler. But then people thought, mm, assembly code, that's really nasty to write. We want to write better C code. So they wrote this nice program. They didn't have any other language than assembly code. So they used assembly code to write a code that translate, translates C code to machine code. So this was our second generation. And then people thought, well, maybe C++ is better. So they started to write a compiler that can produce machine code out of C++ code. And they used C for writing that. So this is our third generation and so on and so forth. And this makes the whole development pro process of, for example, Python much easier. I think it's way easier to write a Python interpreter in C++ or C than to write it in machine code. But that should only be a side note. So we're through with this uh, kind of stuff here. We're going to the next one now. Now I'm going to explain this thing over here. I changed the letter so things might look a little bit difficult. So just to make sure that everyone understands. To take the fun away, we're talking about cross compiling here. And the view is a little bit different to what we ju had just now. When we go back in this diagram, I was focusing on executing or running the compiler itself. So I was telling, 
I want to actually run this compiler, but to run this compiler, we need this compiler and this and this and this. And in the end, we need this compiler, right? We so need, we need all these compilers to run this one. Now, this one here is a little bit difficult. Sorry, different, not difficult. It's just a little bit different. This is not about how to run this one. This is about input and output. And first, I like to watch it in a little bit different way, specifically in this one. So you see clearly there's these two and these two are connected. Let's explain from the problem, starting from the problem. Imagine we have this compiler and that's totally fine, but um, somehow we cannot run any P code anymore. Maybe because our interpreter is crashed. I don't know. Something happened. We cannot run this one. But what we can run is PC code, this one here. So what we actually want to have is this compiler over here. Because we have a PC interpreter, but not a P interpreter. So we have a lot of like, so just to zoom in a little bit, we got some code here. I mean, this is not really zooming in. So we got a lot of code, a lot of logic that translate our C++ code in M machine code. But this is unfortunately written in P code. What we instead want is, I don't know, let's make it like this. We want PC code because we can, we have an interpreter for PC code. So how do we solve that problem? With this nice cross compiler over here. We do not have an interpreter of P code, but we have a compiler that can take P code as input and puts out PC code. So to use the image I just used, we have this like machine or filter that can take P code and gives us PC code. So just simple input output, right? Because P code is just text. Even if it's a compiler, it's just like a bunch of words and PC code is also just a bunch of words. So everything it does is taking these words and putting out these words. So the difference between this image and that one that I just drew before is that I was focusing here on execution, how to run this one. What do we need for running it? In this way, I'm more focusing on I'm having this and I want this. So this is my input and this is my output or making it more compact. This is my input and this is my output and this is the compiler I'm using. And that's basically it for this example. And while doing this video, I realized that cross compiling might be the wrong word for this one. I don't know why I know why I use that word. Probably written in the papers of my professor. I'm not sure about that. If it's the wrong word, I'm really sorry for that. Just ignore the word. But what I'm telling here is totally correct regarding the diagram itself. Okay, so let's go on. This is our last example and and might be a nice task for you. First, what do we see here? We see a compiler that compiles C++ code to C. So to make it more easier, um, input C++ code and output C code. So input text, output text. Then we have another compiler that takes C code as input and puts out machine code as output. Both compilers are written in C code itself. As we cannot execute C code directly on the CPO, we have these interpreters here that read the C code and run it on the CPU. We don't care what language this interpreter uses, so I'm using this smaller, more simpler way of presenting it. Okay, so and the task is, um, we have these things over here and we want this down here. So we want a translation from this one to this one. If you understood how the T diagram actually works, then you should be able to do this. If you can't, just watch the videos again or maybe watch other videos. And the answer comes in three, two, one. Answer without any explanation. Just put this compiler as input into this compiler and then put this compiler as input into itself. And then we got this. If you understood this explanation, you don't need to watch the whole rest of the video. I'm just explaining this a little bit more now. So think of this compiler, not as a compiler, but rather just as 
a package of C code. So just a bunch of text. And by the way, we have a compiler that can compile. We have this nice compiler that actually takes C code, so a C program, and puts out machine code. So everything that is written here in C code, all the logic, everything, is now translated into, of course, three-dimensional machine code. So in case this thing over here was a compiler for C++ to C, then this down here is still a compiler for C++ to C. I hope that's clear. But now it is written in machine codes. Now we have the machine code of this compiler. We don't have the sources, but we have the machine code that still does totally the same. You can imagine this compiler maybe as the source files and this as the compiled output. That's for this one. And then we just think of this one also is a simple C program, right? So we just put this inside itself and what we get is the same as here. We get out machine we, we get machine code out of it. So the implementation language for both change because we put it here in this machine. And that's the long answer to the question. I hope with these videos things cleared up a little bit. If not, please let no, let me know in the comments. And don't forget to check out the description in case I made some corrections. Thanks for watching. I hope it helped.